genetic variant. Now, overall, uh, Alberto identified about 850 regions in the genome that are affecting flowering time. Um, so it isn't five or ten, it's about 850. And I think that's actually, if you think about what's all the things that go into a plant flowering, a lot of it has to do with energy balance, okay? Some of it's figuring out what time of year it is and things like that. But how healthy a plant is affects uh, well, uh, how it's going to flower. And that, I think, is what we're seeing here with these structural regions of the genome. That essentially the centromere, this chromosome 5, the center of it, the centromere has moved around. And Gernot Preston has identified that. And different land races and different inbreds have different centromere locations relative to one another. And we see a big GWAS hit right there. Chromosome 3, again, the centromere, we see a big GWAS hit there. We see, we, uh, Alberto identified an inversion on chromosome 3, a big GWAS hit there. Um, a number of years, a couple years ago, it was identified uh, by Jeff Russell Barr and other groups uh, that there's a big inversion on chromosome 4. And that one also, uh, there's a big GWAS hit there. Uh, this one comes from up, uh, this uh, inversion comes from Mexicana. Uh, and is uh, uh, probably uh, adapt some upland adaptations. But what we're thinking, a lot of these low recombination regions of the genome, it, uh, essentially you're getting complementation of deleterious mutations, and that's why you're getting a flowering time effect at them. The one, this one on chromosome 4, given its origin in, uh, you know, with the, um, with Mexicana, maybe a straight adaptive loci. But for example, a lot of these don't have any candidate genes that we know of in them. So it really, it's much more likely they have more to do with the energy balance uh, of the plant. So I think, you know, where the good variation is, and obviously we've only really played with uh, flowering time and height, but I think, you know, the good, germ the really good alleles for the future and the lessons to be learned about adaptation are sitting in the germplasm banks here. Uh, and tapping that uh, diversity is, I think, one of the things we can still do uh, much better. So let's end up here on where are the bad mutations. So, yeah, deleterious mutations are really at the heart of inbreeding depression and heterosis. People such as Jones and Neal, you know, saw this n nearly almost, you know, closing in on 100 years ago, that uh, you inbreed a line. And it looks like crap. It's horrible. <laughs> and uh, it took a lot of years to, for people to make inbred lines that uh, were good. And they were purging deleterious mutations uh, in order to make inbred lines that were any good. And so when you know, people have uh, you know, some other ideas about what, what is the basis of heterosis and inbreeding depression, I mean, I think the people almost 100 years ago had it pretty much right as to what the general basis is. Now the question is, can we figure out more what that means at a molecular level? Can we do something about it in an intelligent way? So one, of the, one thing that really got me into heterosis was, of course, um, was, was actually working with NAM. And you know, heterosis is essentially the inverse of inbreeding depression. And when you inbreed a line, of course, there's regions of the genome where that maintain residual heterozygosity. Most of that is random, but regions that don't inbreed well over time, essentially that's because they, essentially uh, they were going extinct when they got inbred, uh, and they died. And so we've actually seen from doing some genotyping of cement lines, we see more residual heterozygosity in some of these materials, probably because of the you have relatively young inbred lines relative to some of the North American ones which have already gone through 70 years of that purging. If we were to been genotyping uh, in the U.S. inbred lines of you know, the 40s, uh, we may have seen a different pattern than what we do uh, today. But we saw this also when we took NAM. And here we took the crosses between B73 and uh, CML52, and just as one example. And you know, this is what you expect residual heterozygosity to be at, uh, after each generation. And so we asked the question when we got to this generation, is that the level of residual heterozygosity that we actually saw? And the neat thing about making a bunch of inbred lines is you essentially have 5,000 parallel experiments that you can add up and look at and see these patterns. And the first thing that was surprising is that across the genome, every genome really contributed pretty much equally to those crosses. These are the, uh, the proportion of the donor genome. Um, and you know, most of them are within uh, one or two percent 
of what the initial cross was. So there really wasn't a big deviation um, of which parent uh, was contributing. Surprisingly, the tropical lines, even though we did a lot of the increasing, the tropical lines were more fit than the temperate lines were. There's a slight deviation towards the tropical lines overall relative to the temperate ones. This suggested that temp uh, tropical alleles on average were a little better even than compared to some of the US material that had been bred for a long period of time. There's also, we also look region by region across the genome. And so when you have 5,000 lines, you expect everything to segregate pretty much within this 48% to 52% range. Um, and so anything that really spreads out farther than that is evidence of, uh, uh, of some kind of selection or uh, carrying of deleterious mutations. And so while 94% of the genome seems to be what you think really doesn't very, relatively narrow, you know, in this, this type of range right here, 59% of it was in this red region that essentially was significantly deviating from our expectation, but only slightly. And so that suggested there were slight fitness differences all across the genome. Uh, and that's really a, you know, a suggestion that there's deleterious mutation, modest deleterious mutations in lots of different regions of the genome. So then this got us back to this plot here, where we know there's different recombination across the genome. And it varies by a big orders, uh, several orders of magnitude. And, but we still have a bunch of genes that are in this low recombination region of the genome. And that sets up a question, what happens to these regions of the genome that don't recombine very well? So when we use the data, uh, look at residual heterozygosity, and we plot it out chromosome by chromosome in maize, what you see is that the centromeric regions have a little bit more residual heterozygosity than the chromosomal arms do. And it's the exact same pattern on every single chromosome. You know, it's, and in, the, in the, a lot of the US material, we know chromosome five is the region that has the largest heterosis, and it had the biggest deviation. So, um, and then you can plot out resi uh, recombination versus residual heterozygosity. And chromosome nine is a fairly standard pattern where and I've plotted the inverse of recombination here, so the lines go up in the same direction. Where, resi where residual heterozygosity was uh, highest right here, we had the least recombination. And they track one another quite well across the genome. And even chromosomes like four, which have really weird recombination patterns, they uh, are, continue to share that same type of uh, pattern. So recombination. Uh, explained about 32% of the variance for residual heterozygosity, and things like gene density and diversity explain nothing. So this gave rise, this is essentially goes back to that very old model. Restricted recombination gives rise to repulsion, uh, ha ends up with repulsion QTL. The population genetics term for this across a population is Hill-Robertson interference. That leads to uh, pseudo-overdominance. And so when, you know, obviously people do see overdominance, but that's because of a lack of recombination. And that's giving rise to heterosis. So I think we're seeing very good evidence there for that. And so the question was, in the last few years, is can we take those observations and bring them down to the nucleotide level? So one of the great things about whole genome sequencing is that we can apply it to lots of species. And we can start taking the maize genome and lining it up to every monocot there is that's been whole genome sequenced. And that's what uh, we've done. And you have some expectations that, for example, we've lined maize up all the way out to banana. And if a base pair is highly conserved at, you know, across all those species, that must be a very important base pair. Um, there are actually, just if you don't have a feeling for this, there's 150,000 bases in the maize genome or amino acids in the maize genome that haven't changed even with archaeobacteria and eubacteria. Okay? So there's things that essentially all of life has never changed. And, uh, and, but you can look at other more recent ones and you can see that same type of pattern. So the GURP statistic uh, developed by the human genetics community uh, helps summarize this type of pattern. And so we can summarize base pair by base pair in the genome how conserved that base is across deeper levels of evolution. And then that gives us an expectation to wh which are mo the most deleterious mutations. So we, ha we think that low recombination regions should have more deleterious mutations. And that's what Eli added up those types of uh, these GURPS scores. And what we found is, yes, much higher uh, deleterious mutation load 
uh, in low recombination regions than in high recombination regions. And then let's go to chromosome 5. I mentioned previously this is the region that got, uh, historically has the most heterosis in maize. Lot, the green shows you where recombination is. It's on the chromosomal arms. And then there's a big region in the middle with very little recombination. And then the black lines indicate uh, summaries of the GURP scores. And these are summaries of where we've gone through base pair by base pair, seeing how many deleterious mutations there are. And what you see is this big enrichment across the low recombination regions of the genome. These essentially now become actionable nucleotides that are essentially preventing the plant from being as vigorous as it could be. So this is where, if those of you who are interested in CRISPR and things like that, these are the lists, you know, we can give you a list of bad looking SNPs. I don't know how good, that, how good we are at, at predicting them, but in bulk, I think we're, we now can start identifying the deleterious mutations, uh, base pair by base pair across the genome. The second thing we saw is that the way recombination works in maize, and it turns out in all species, is, isn't quite the way you would expect it to. So there's a lot of, uh, there's crossovers, and you know, that's the one everybody keeps an eye on, breeders think about all the time. The type of recombination you may not think about all the time is gene conversion. So gene conversion happens when you get these double-stranded breaks, and then there's a holiday junction that forms uh, during recombination. And this may be the one form of recombination that really is effective in these low re other the regions that don't uh, do crossovers very frequently. There's 500 of these across the genome every generation. And, but sometimes you'll get a mismatch uh, between two, two alleles, say a G and a T allele. And, and essentially the, the repair mechanism of an organism needs to decide eventually, is this going to be a G or a, a C, or is it going to be an A or a T? And you'd expect it to be kind of random. But it turns out that it's not. Uh, there's a system out there called GC bias gene conversion that essentially biases those corrections back to Gs and, and Cs. And that uh, essentially becomes a mutagenic process that puts mutations at where double-stranded breaks occur. And so the question is then, where did those double-stranded breaks happen? Where does gene conversion happen? And so we've uh, started to ask that question, and we went to those M that MNase data again. Because we also know that in order to f figure out where you're going to cross over, you have to f it has to be open chromatin, and essentially the uh, two chromatids need to be able to find one another in, in order to cross over. And so this, in this complicated plot, these are, this is the center of where these MNase regions are. And in blue are the invariant sites across the genome, and we look at the GC content. So what we're expecting is some change in GC content from the, based on this process. Invariant sites, these are highly conserved. You can think of these. These are some of the base pairs that can't really change all the way back to banana or something like that. But the neutral sites are the, uh, uh, are the third codon positions and so on. And if you look out, here's the, new, uh, the uh, MNA in 180 base pairs to each side of it, uh, there's a big shift in GC contact. And that's being caused by the, mu uh, essentially we think, the mutation process of this biased gene conversion. Now, this buildup, big, a little, this big shift occurs because these are neutral sites. But what we would also, you see these slight deviations to the left and right of it in the invariant sites. Those are a bunch of deleterious mutations that are being put down in the genome by recombination. And so every time recombination, double-stranded breaks are going on, you're essentially putting in down a series of uh, uh, mutations across there. Now, it's more valuable to recombine than to not put down these mutations on average. Uh, but essentially, that's, we also know where another region is that's likely to have, and these, you know, some are in those paracentromeric regions, but other ones are going to be near where regions get lots of recombination. So, where are the deleterious mutations in the maize genome? Well, first off, there's about 90 of these per generation. One to five of them are deleterious. Um, the buildup of deleterious mutations is like to, likely to be in these paracentromeric locations. And then also the flanking double-stranded break regions in the genome. And I think, you know, w with this type of knowledge, there's numerous opportunities now to improve the prediction of which are the most deleterious mutations. 
So we're now going through and adding in uh, several hundred other different genomic attributes to try to pick out exactly how deleterious each mutation is and train models on them. So I think we can finally turn to how we think we should, this variation should be deployed. You know, the standard breeding model that we've all been kind of working on, you don't need to explain that here, make crosses, inbreed, and so on. Um, this is the idealized world of, uh, you know, my genetics way of thinking about fast genomic selection. The key cycle thing I view is can we go from five years to that four month uh, type uh, thing? Can we make this system run 15 times faster? And I think, you know, maybe in some of the big seed companies, they, they can make this cycle in terms of full efficiency two to three times faster right now. Uh, and I think that's good. Um, but if we can get down to single nucleotide understanding, I think there's opportunities to go, you know, start approaching closer to, to these types of numbers. And so I think we're going to start seeing a world where we shift from genomics assisted breeding, where we really are, you know, using those anonymous markers across the genome and helping drive large haplotypes to, uh, uh, in frequency the right direction. But I think we're also then going to see over the next five to ten years a big shift where it really becomes biology assisted uh, breeding. We're not going to just use recombination and field trials to identify all the functional sites across the genome. Uh, areas such as molecular biology, I, you know, I finally think are finally giving us something useful uh, that can help us out in quantitative genetics. And uh, physiology, biochemistry of these, we know there's various genes and pathways that we can start looking at, at complementation. And then evolution is an incredibly strong tool for figuring out uh, what portions of the genome are most important. Because essentially, evolution's already done a billion years of field trials. And, you know, we should never ignore uh, the fact that that's the, you know, area where it's almost, the, and if you can read D uh, DNA sequence fast, you know, that's the easiest thing in the world to do is read off evolution and the products of e evolution. So I think this is going to give us this world where we can then make these crosses much faster. Um, but as people like John Hickey have been starting to simulate, um, if we can get uh, CRISPR and genome editing to work at the efficiencies people believe it can, you know, we are starting working towards a world where we're going to have a list of the 50, the 100, the 1,000 base pairs across the genome that really need to be modified in order to take, uh, you know, what looks like maybe an adapted inbred line and really make it a much more vigorous inbred line uh, that could be used in breeding. So the conclusions, boring variation, 95% uh, of the genome. The good, you guys have it. Uh, we don't, may not know how to tap it all right now, but it's sitting here, okay? Uh, oops. Uh, uh, the bad variation is pretty much everywhere, but it's certainly enriched in some of these other regions of the genome. And I think we really are at an exciting point where we can design uh, these crops much more, fa uh, much more quickly if we start paying attention to what some of the genome is telling us. And so I want to remind you about the Mace Diversity Project. And I'm recruiting postdocs, so if uh, anybody's looking for another position. And uh, I think just to remind people, we're, uh, 150 years ago, Mendel discovered his loss. And so it's a kind of fun to reflect where we've learned, where we've come from and everything. And so I was at a meeting uh, earlier this year, uh, taking a look. That was me in 1990. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but. I think what, what 2040 it could look like with our understanding of genetics and where we can start applying to systems like that is just wonderful. So I'll end there and uh, take any questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that, that's our best. I mean, 
you know, Jeff Rosabar and John Dobley have tried to estimate what the de novo mutation rate is. Uh, and that's what they think, that, that's their best estimate as the um, mu mutation rate is across the genome. And I'm just, the, the, you get to the one to five, it looks to me that about one to five percent of the genome is under selection. The other 95 percent of the genome isn't under selection. So if I take those 90 mutations, multiply times five percent, that's where I get the one to five. So you think that you, you think that's too too low or too high? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, uh, I mean, essentially, there's been a lot of work also in humans now looking at the, de I mean, uh, deleterious mutations, because obviously they're at the basis of disease and everything else. Um, and there's a lot of deleterious mutations out there, a lot of genetic load. Um, I think one estimate is that essentially humans are only about at 5% of their potential fitness if you were able to eliminate the load. So organisms like maize are actually much healthier than humans are. We, we, you know, we've had such small effective population sizes. We produce so few offspring and so something like that compared to a corn plant uh, and everything. We're far less fit. Um, and and that, the whole thing is any large, or, large organism has this problem, okay? So it's not, uh, you know, we're not unique in this uh, thing. Uh, only bacteria are pretty good at uh, getting rid of their genetic load. Uh, everything else has to deal with it. Um, we'd love to have that. M those MNAs assays are actually relatively expensive. They're unlike a lot of other genomic sequencing things. Uh, these still require a fair amount of depth, and so we've only done it uh, for those two tissues that I've shown you from B73. Um, now, what I think is surprising is how much genetic variance that explains from only looking at B73. That kind of suggests that these MNAs uh, enhancer elements, and, and actually we, we know a lot of them are very conserved. So when people like... Uh, uh, um, Mike Freely had been talking about conserved non-coding sequences. Those conserved non-coding sequences, many of them are these enhancer elements that are in these distant locations that are highly conserved. And so uh, I think they'll change through development. Um, I don't think we would certainly find more if we sequence more lines and uh, do more lines, and we absolutely should. But I don't think you're going to, uh, it'll change the picture, but I don't think it'll change it dramatically because most of these enhancer elements are present in every line all the time or else they're so unfit they you know, don't express. So, uh, but I think in development what you should see, what we, uh, what we think we're seeing is essentially in seedlings the superset of open regions in the genome. So it, through development we expect to see fewer of these regions be open. But some enhancers have to change and everything. And so you know, it's, we'd love to see more but we don't have the data for it. Because you have you have you have three you have three no no because you have three copies of the genome. I mean I, I would actually argue the reason why wheat became a hexaploid and I think most polyploidy is out there is to escape inbreeding depression. I mean essentially every I mean everybody talks about how important polyploidy is and everything, but there's only really been about 20 important polyploidy events in all angiosperm evolution. The rest of the time polyploidy is occurring. It's an escape mechanism from inbreeding depression. And, uh, and so it lasts for a while, and then, the, and then they go extinct again. Uh, so it's a short-term escape me mechanism because these genomes are too big to purge genetic load. 
I mean, the problem is recombinate chromosomes stink. Okay, the 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 basic uh, uh, nature of how recombination works in genetics. There's just not enough mixing, given 40,000 genes and 2.3 million base pairs. The genome cannot eliminate enough things fast enough. And this is so you're getting Mueller's ratchet working and building up and uh, you know knocking out these. And so you reason you don't see much cirrhosis in wheat is because you've got a triploid genome right now, but also that restricts your ability to evolve too because you've got to have three copies of everything out there. So, uh, you know, you know I, yeah, it, I think it's an escape mechanism. You know, from an evolution perspective, sure, makes sense, but it's not an engineer. You wouldn't engineer it this way. So, so what, yeah, so what, this is where I think, think tools like, I think the most beautiful thing about cr technologies like CRISPR, the problem I kind of always view with breeding is we can only cross two things at once, right? You know, that, uh, you, you can't, uh, but what we'd really like to know is I'd like to stick a hun the hundred best, my hundred best hypotheses from a hundred different land raises into something simultaneously, okay? I don't want to cr make the, all the crosses to get them all in there. I want to do them simultaneously into one nucleus at a time. And so what I would think you know, one of the exciting things to do would be to learn from the land races, learn from all these diverse programs, and then throw them into elite best backgrounds and figure, see how often you're right, how often you're wrong. You know, and we'll be wrong a lot. I mean, I, you know, and so that's the whole key is how can we get fast enough at this whole thing so that even though you're going to be wrong 98% of the time, that that 2% is, still adds up. No, no, but that, that's why I think tools like genome editing are really key. Because essentially you don't reshuffle everything. You reshuffle you, you, the, the key sites. I mean, we we can we can see what goes on in between nowadays. Uh, so, so do we, we need to break up or? So we're you know actually. Uh, starting from Denise's work, we're actually using Tripsicum a lot right now to clone for cold tolerance loci. So I think using this, you know, Teosinte is re really good. But again, there's some, but moving chromosomal segments across, I think you have so much linkage drag and so much junk you're pulling across that you don't want to give up on 10,000 years of breeding. Again, you want to figure things out. You want to figure out some key traits in Teosinte, probably in Teosinte. And then transgenome or uh, genome edited them across. You know, I, I, you know, so we want to learn all we can from Tripsicum because I think there's gr you know, great things in Tripsicum, but I'm not going to make a cross between Tripsicum and maize to try to get that thing across. <laughs> uh, 